Hi, and welcome to the Fishing Matters podcast. These podcasts are designed to introduce you to all sorts of interesting topics and interesting people in the fishing world. And tonight we have with us Darian Shaheen. And Darian is, of course, familiar to many of you who've ever shopped at the Complete Angler because he's been here for a long period of time. And his history is that, of course, he's come across from the United States to fish our wonderful country here. Welcome, mate. Good, Good to evening. See you. Thanks, Mel. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. Now, um, just tell us a little bit about your background because a lot of people wouldn't know what you got up to when you were in the United States in terms of you know where you fished, what your uh, desire was and to get into it. And uh, yeah, a little bit about your background there. Well, Dad basically started me off fishing, and basically, in Southern California, we didn't have a lot of trout there, so we started bass fishing. Dad was a tournament bass fisherman, so we'd get out on the Skeeter boat, and we'd bass fish in the morning, water ski in the afternoon, and that really cut my teeth. And it, back in the 80s, that was when we got into soft bed plastics. Then rubber worms, you know, that was kind of left for a long period of time. I went to Switzerland, left it a little bit, got into skiing a lot, Came back to Colorado, went to university there, and that's where it really rekindled my, my love of fishing, basically. Fly fishing was introduced to me at that point, and, and I was away in, in the headwaters of the Colorado streams. So you had trout there, many different species, rainbows, uh, cut bows, golden, browns, even had pike, tiger, musky, various other species, carp in Denver's rivers. So, um, and that really started to take off back then, but it's, it's, it's actually big right now, but... It's it, pretty neat coming up with that, but most of the fishing and fly fishing was indicator fishing. We were locked into only limited stretches of water that it was public land in America. So basically, whereas here, we've got everywhere you could possibly want to go. You say, I see that blue line, I want to go do it. Whereas mm. in America, you said, I see that blue line and it's locked in with private land and private land. So you're always limited to that. So um, being over here, I think it's pretty neat that you can go wherever you want. Um, so you enjoyed mainly your, your fly fishing. Was that, you'd say, was the thing that you focused on when you were over there? Or did you do a little bit of soft plastic and other fishing there at Well, the we grew time? up doing a lot of soft plastics. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Dad was being in the, in the bass tournaments and stuff like that. So we were using uh, worms on, on bullet head sinkers and, mm -hmm. and fishing them against bakes and, and throwing buzzers and, and different topwater mm -hmm. lures. And that was, that was always a, a lot of fun. Um, but that was when I was younger and when I got older and got into the fly fishing. You know, it was dry fly, dry dropper, hopper dropper type fishing where you could slap it on the water in summertime and have a big fish come up erupt underneath it. It, it doesn't get much better than that. So, um, yeah. We hear some pretty good stories about the, the numbers of fish that you had over there. Would you say that um, what you were fishing in was really quite a prolific fishery? Well, Colorado's pretty amazing that the numbers of fish per mile kilometer for that matter are quite high because they're stocking them you're at elevation so the fish aren't going to be quite as big here so a lot of these fish are kind of six inches 15 centimeters not overly huge but you're catching 20 30 50 fish a day mm -hmm. and it's very hatch driven so it's not like here where we have systems where you got to get the fly in front of the fish and have it drift perfectly there you could basically stand in front of it if that hatch is on using the right fly is always the perfect thing. And the difference between a size 20 and a 22 would be whether you catch a fish almost every cast or not. Whereas here, you got to get the fly to come perfectly to that fish without that fish being aware of us. So, yeah, it's, it, it, there are nuances and differences, but pretty amazing for numbers. Here we got size that's pretty spectacular. So you fished, obviously, in Colorado. What about the other areas in the States that you might have fished? Do you, do you really rate some other areas that were a go-to place for you? We, well, when I grew up, we did do some trout fishing up in Northern California in the Tahoe area, uh, Mammoth Lakes area, um, the Eastern Sierras, which is high desert, similar to the McKenzie Basin, but on a bigger scale. It's, it's quite a big area. Um, so, yeah, you had that western desert, you know, feel to it. So it was quite neat and a little bit different than here. But we've got that diversity here, which is pretty cool. So Mackenzie mm. makes me feel at home like in Colorado or the Sierras, whereas the west coast is quite bushy. And that sometimes is a bit, you know, foreign to me, but mm. fun at the same time. So we, did you ever do any saltwater fishing over there? I know you have a love of saltwater fishing. That's why I'm asking this question. Did, where did that love affair with saltwater start? Well, we did do some trips when we were in college, went down to Cabo San Lucas, and we did some fishing down there. Me and Dad did some marlin fishing 
um, also. So you go out and you troll around and you get my my and, and I didn't get a Marlin myself. Dad's gotten a pretty good size one, but uh, yeah, that that really spurred me on because we'd go out on these trolling trips and you go out and you got to share the chair and it's your time or it's not. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, this would be awesome if I were ever to get one, but I'd rather be doing a little bit more. So what we did is we went out and we hired some little Mexican guy in a little boat for 50 bucks a day. And then we'd be throwing spinners for my, my, and you're catching all kinds of species and it's on light tackle. And that's really the excitement. Whereas you're catching a 20 pound my, my, which would be a good fish on 80 pound Marlin gear it's not that dynamic so um, the light tackle medium-sized fish is is really cool and that's really where it, it kind of hooked me in and I think once I started getting into the fly rod and, and targeting some of the species in places like New Caledonia or Christmas Island or even Golden Bay around here is that you're seeing these fish it's a visual experience you've got to be Johnny on the spot that you get that fly to that spot or that moment's gone so and it, it, it's that kind of excitement and urgency to that fishery that really is quite compelling for me and then you get the hit and it's like lightning down the rod you've got electric coming down there and the fish runs and it's not 10 meters 20 meters 30 meters we're talking 50 100 150 meter runs and it's it, yeah it captures the imagination you've got me all wound up now because i've got to admit that one of my absolute loves is going saltwater fly fishing because there's nothing quite like the thrill when you feel like you've you've got a, a heaven on a stick really where you've got this amazing fish on the other end of this now obviously you moved from uh the united states to new zealand what brought that about well that would be my wife i met her in denver so uh and she always said she wanted to bring up kids here, and I thought that would be quite a hardship to come from Colorado, which was pretty darn good fly fishing, to one of the world-class destinations for trout fishing, period. You know, So I said, yeah, maybe I will move over to New Zealand. I'll give it a look. And um, knowing a little bit about how you've adapted to New Zealand, um, it seems to me like you've fallen in love with it. What did you find were the greatest differences between fishing over the United States and then coming here and what is essentially a wee bit tougher fishery. You know, as you said before, you've got uh, fewer fish, but they're bigger. Uh, how did you find all that or adapting to that? Well, I think the, the transition, though, for me, when I first came over, my wife being from the North Island, we fished the North Island creeks, more rainbows, and we spent some time up in Taupo. So that suited what I came from because in Colorado we were doing a lot of indicator fishing that you're watching this indicator come down the creek pause for a sec and that was the moment you had to hit that sucker the moment was lost so fishing seems in a true dead drift on the Tongariro really came into my my wheelhouse so I could really get into that and I caught some of the biggest trout I've ever caught and I think me and dad were in a competition at the time and I was over here fishing the Tongariro. Dad was fishing the Skeena for steelhead and I think I got a seven pound rainbow out of the Tongariro. Dad got a 10 pound steelhead out of that. So he beat me by just a day. So I only held the record in the family for a little while at that point, but I've, I've overcome it. You've overcome that. That's very good. And of course you've, you've moved south to uh, Christchurch. When was that? What, what year was that you came through? 2004 is when we moved down here. So, right. so that's 15 years ago. Indeed. Mm, Indeed. Yeah, my time flies quickly, as it were. And I know that you came and worked to us, worked with uh, the Complete Angler about that time. Um, and how, how did you find adapting to Canterbury fishing? Loved it. It was, it was a challenge that, yes, I had to go find the fish. I'd say that my spotting skills probably aren't as polished as they are now, that in Colorado, looking for six-inch fish in dirtier water than we face here you just don't see them. So I joked, I didn't spot anything under five pounds, but my skill wasn't there and it was a skill I had to hone. So there were a lot of things that I had to improve on to really excel here. Whereas in Colorado, the cast wasn't as important as you would deal with here, We're dealing with nine foot leaders, uh, relatively easy to cast that in a wind, didn't have to worry about your back cast. Whereas here, we're throwing 15 foot leaders, 20 foot leaders, um, in a heavy wind and to fish that are quite temperamental. And, and that challenge is, is difficult, but it's very compelling and rewarding at the same time. So is that you might catch one fish that's five pounds, but that's better than 10 fish, you know, at five pounds also. So. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, now I understand about the reward of it because um, I indeed have been one who's just loved Canterbury fishing. And I think sometimes 
we lose sight of just how phenomenal it is. And there's much of what we say that we, you know, it was better in the 80s and the 90s, and, and I guess that's true in many ways. But I know that for you, as your skills have developed, your catch rate's really gone up as well. Oh, it exponentially. Is once you can put all the pieces together, it's not just one thing. Yeah, if you can cast, that makes a big difference. Mm. The wind is your friend is something that I talk about when I'm out with my friends or teaching or guiding or whatever, is, is that the wind gives you cover. But if you can't cast in it, it, certainly it's an enemy instead of a friend. But if you're, if you're there, you have the ability to deliver that fly through a 40K headwind. You've got a great shot of catching that fish because that fish is relaxed. It's looking for food to fall onto the water. And basically, they're easier because you can get closer. So it sounds to me like you understand the importance of getting your skills up when it comes to being uh, productive and really enjoying your days around here. Because um, I guess when you look at the amount of water that's out there available to us, it's quite extreme. And uh, I know from personal experience that the wind can be quite challenging for us, but you seem to be one of those who's very much overcome that. And that allows you to have uh, extremely good results under those, those difficult times. Uh, what would you say to someone who's interested in getting involved in, in fishing, say, in a New Zealand situation, or someone from overseas who's thinking about coming here? Uh, any advice that you'd like to give them? Well, first off, I'd say practice your casting, because casting is so important. It's always going to be windy in New Zealand. So if you can practice that, that's awesome. Second, get a guide. They're going to help you. They're going to get you on the pace. They're going to be able to hone your skills. Even if you're an expert, it doesn't matter. You don't have those skills that are needed here. You may be an amazing saltwater fisherman that can throw a 100-foot fly line. But the key is that you have to put that fly in front of the fish far enough that it comes naturally to it, but not too far that you line it. If this fish sees a fly line, gone. You hit the water too hard, gone. you got to do a lot of things very well to succeed here. And we're talking 15 foot, 20 foot leaders. So the bottom line is, is it's not a, an eight, nine foot leader that's easy to turn over. You gotta push this sucker into a 40K headwind to get it to work. And if those skills are honed, the rewards are huge. I mean, I, I talked about five pound fish earlier. I love five pound fish coming from six inch Colorado fish. But the reality is, is we've got fish, you know, eight, 10, 12. I mean, my personal best in, in a backcountry situation happened to be in a mouse year, but was 13 and a half pounds. That's mind bending by world standards. It just doesn't happen anywhere else other than New Zealand, South America, and, and a handful of other places. It's, it's, it is quite astounding. Would you like to comment on, on the fact of just how free the access is here compared to what you've experienced overseas. It strikes me that sometimes people don't appreciate what's actually on the doorstep of, of New Zealand. And of course, you mentioned um, a mouse year, which is an extraordinary event where we have uh, the beech trees flowering and lots and lots of mice getting around and they just love swimming. And they're terrible swimmers in the sense that they choose to swim through trout's lairs, as it were, and you can get these amazing fish. I know that you've had um, mouse seasons, as, as have I, um, you know, how does that compare on a world scale, the fact that you can actually go out there, not have to pay anybody any money, and uh, actually do it yourself, or if you want to take a guide, obviously that's going to help you, but uh, you know, that's on our back doorstep. Well, the reality is, is there is virtually no private land here that you get locked up into, and you're only hemmed into a little area, whereas here, we look at the blue lines on the map, we go out and we explore. And that, that's really the beauty here is that you're not boxed in by private land in Colorado. If a landowner owned both sides of the river, he owned the top inch of water. So you literally had to go through his land with dive tanks if you ever thought to, or you had to work out an arrangement that he allowed you on there with a drift boat or whatever that was. Here, you see it. If there's a bridge to access that river and it's a sizable river, you can walk as far as you want, which there is nowhere in the world that offers that that has this range of rivers within, I mean, we're in Christchurch, so we have, what, 200 pieces of water within two hours drive of Christchurch? It's obscene. So tell me a little bit about some of the, the fishing that you've done and the likes of, say, the canals. Now, the background on our Tekapo Twizel Canal system, of course, is that there are just enormous fish there on, on a world scale. And um, I, I, I think you've probably a wee bit, like I was in the early days where we thought, oh, you know, it looks a little bit easy or somehow it's cheating. Uh, but I know that you have become a real 
uh, aficionado, a real proficient angler down in those canal areas. How do you how do you see those now? You know, and again, in the context of of the world, in the context of what we have available here in New Zealand. Well, yeah, quite honestly, when I first looked at the canals, I looked at them as massive man-made structures that you know oh it's like going and it's hunting cows it, you know it's easy you know i had all these misconceptions quite frankly i was wrong that i had my golden halo of my fly rod even when i first started going down there i did use my fly rod an awful lot and and yeah you can catch fish and you can catch some of those very big ones but the reality is is some of the techniques that have evolved for fishing the canals the egg rolling the soft baiting just it's efficiencies on a fly rod it can be done. It's just not efficient like it is on this gear. And this gear is more like fly fishing than, than it ever would be spinning. Is that, I mean, when we teach the soft bait schools, what do we say more than anything is don't wind, mm -hmm. which it's like long range check nymphing. It, it's more being in contact and being in the moment so that you can connect with these fish where you can't just throw it out there and go to autopilot and wind it back. That, that is rudimentary spinning, not spinning at a high level, but um the, the the egg rolling and the touch fishing and the contact fishing is is very very technical because most guys will say comments and i'm sure you've heard it is i'm doing what he's doing but i'm not catching anything and whether that's that they don't have gear that's sensitive enough to do it whether they're not sensitive enough in their feel or educated finger enough to feel what's going on out there and getting that feedback of knowing that was different than every other feel or every little bump and bounce out there and learning that it, it makes a huge difference of whether you catch one fish a day, which eats it and goes, and everybody gets that fish, to getting the 30, 40 other takes mm -hmm. and putting those dots together. Yeah, you won't catch every one of them, but the more you're aware of, the, the higher the rate you're going to catch down there. And it is a challenge. It's not easy. you got to be on the game. you got to be able to explore different um, different things, like i got to change my fly regularly. You know, If we're fly fishing, we put a fly in front of a fish, it rejects it we know better than to put the same fly it didn't like back out there and have it look at it. It's going to move away. Whereas when we're spinning in the canals, we can't see them, but that doesn't mean they didn't like it the first time. They're going to like it the second. You know, we change fly, put something out there, find something that's more compelling for them on that day. And that, that's the journey. That's the joy. It's a lot of fun to do it. And the canals, it, it's a dynamic system. I mean, over the last couple of years, we've had dirty water. When we started, we used to do a lot of soft baiting, the waters got clearer and clearer, started to go to this egg rolling, started to catch rainbows like we never did before, and big ones. I mean, not just 10 pound, it's 20 pound, 30 pound. I mean, yourself has got fish over 30, Richard's got fish over 30. Uh, that really is the benchmark and, and the, the hallowed ground of canal fishing is that if you can truly get a 30 pound fish out of there, that is truly remarkable. Where tens is awesome, 20s should be expected, but 30 is that benchmark. And, there is nowhere in the world you can go down and catch a 10 pound fish on any given day other than the Canterbury Canals. I think that um, a lot of the sport fishing that we have, and really that's what we're talking about, rather than just meat collecting, but really going out there and trying to unravel the mystery of how do we catch these fish is probably one of the most challenging things that I personally have found. And I, I've, I've observed you as you've all of a sudden um, really grasped what's going on. And I see you running ahead with new ways of doing things and, and uh, new techniques. Do you find that that freshness wants you to get you down there again? Oh, absolutely. I was, I was down last Thursday and I want to go again. It's the, the, the bottom line is you go, you learn something, or you see something you didn't discover, and, and that's that's the beauty of, of fishing, period, is that if we figured it out, we'd be done. We'd be on to something else. If it was easy, we could say, I'm going to catch 20, 30 fish every day. I'd be doing something else. But the reality is, is I'm confronted with a challenge every day I go out, whether it's the weather, whether it's what the heck are they eating today. Um, you know, we don't have, in New, in New Zealand, there was no match the hatch type fishery. Rarely do you get it occasionally in, in, in the autumn, but for the most part, Colorado was, you could change your fly by what time it was during the day. You knew you fish this in the morning, you fish this a little bit later, you fish this a little bit later, and you knew exactly what's going on. Here, they key onto certain things and the invertebrate life never had a natural predator. So there's a smorgasbord, there's caddis, there's stoneflies, there's mayflies, you know, all these things coming down to them at the same time. And for some reason, they're keying on one of them on that particular day. 
not like in Colorado where a million bugs go up at the same time and it's critical to have that same size fly because you have a size 12 and they're all 18s, that one looks weird. Whereas here, you've got all these different things, but for some reason they're keying on one specific bug and that sometimes is a tough nut to crack. Mm. Yeah. I'm fascinated with um, watching people grow and develop in the, in the uh, whole sport of fishing. And of course, I've been associated with fishing for a long period of time, as have you, in terms of just what we do for day-to-day -day life. And I know that you do a lot of tuition and guiding. Uh, your attitude to that, of course, brings a lot of people into the sport. What would you say was the greatest hindrance to people coming into, say, fly fishing or, or perhaps fishing the canals or even going up and catching kingfish and so forth? What, where do you think that the, the limitations are? In fly fishing, I think it's a skill set. I, th I think you can't just pick up a fly rod and go out with, with Uncle Johnny, who's, who's fly fished a couple times, and, and succeed. Mm -hmm. I think that it, it is a challenging place to fish, is that you're confronted with smart fish in very clear water, and typically it's going to be windy at some point in the day. So getting the fly to the fish, that's tough enough on its own to, to be able to do that. So if you can get a class that gives you the ability to know where to start. Whereas if you don't know where to start, you really got to be mad about the idea of fly fishing because it's going to be a long time before you succeed. Whereas if you go out with somebody that, that is a guide, you get a lesson, you take a class, a lot of times you've got a good foundation so you understand where to start so that you get there, then you know what questions to start asking. Whereas you go out and you're you're a blind man in the wilderness trying to figure out i got a fly box full of flies the shop gave me i don't know what i should use i'll try this one whether it's the right one or not whether it's fished in a dead drift it's just learning in a vacuum is difficult learning with somebody who's done the hard yards can put you onto it and, and really increase success and and that's what we're all about i mean we want to go out there and enjoy the wilderness and be out there in these wild places with these wild animals but the bottom line is we want to catch fish too. Everybody wants to catch fish. Mm. It is lovely to be there, but I've got to admit that I do prefer catching fish to not catching fish. I'm very interested in this whole area of being able to impart skill set. And I know for me, um, who has long been associated with, with fly fishing uh, and fly fishing schools, I've found them to be highly productive in terms of getting people over that apprenticeship hump. And I know that you are very much involved with doing not only guiding, but also fly fishing schools. Um, tell us a bit about what you teach and what, what goes on in, in a normal uh, fly fishing school situation to get people over that apprenticeship hump, and get them out there enjoying what is just a phenomenal fishery. Because uh, I see, as you do, the greatest limitation, a lack of a skill set or the, the unawareness of the little critical things. It's like, you know, if there's 95 things you're doing right, you can be doing five things wrong, and those things are what's holding you back. So being able to get through that, of course, is extremely uh, valuable. Hmm. Hmm. I, th I think with teaching the schools and, and, and like the Complete Angler Fly School, which is in like a classroom setting and we do structured casting lessons it's it's four classes basically we talk about the gear because when you come in you look at thousand dollar fly rods or three hundred dollar fly rods why would you pay the difference i mean people who've never done this have no idea that why what the difference is and why you'd spend the money but the reality is is yeah that three hundred dollar fly rod might work that thousand dollar fly rod gets that fly there that much more effectively and I try and make it make sense with all the gear, whether it's how do you build leaders, what fly to use at what time of year. So we talk about etymology in one, two hour session. So when you come into the complete angler and you look at 17,000 flies over there, you say, where do I start? With this course, you know I can get a cup full of flies right off. It's gonna give me a shot at getting a fish at this time of year. I don't need to buy every fly for the entire year, which is cool, we encourage that, we'll, we'll sell that. but. Um, the bottom line is, is we can get you the flies for that time of year. And once you've taken the course, you know where to start. You know what to look for so that when you do see a hatch coming off, because well, it's a mayfly, I can, I can put a mayfly out there or I can put an emerger or I could put a, a blowfly. But the bottom line is with the courses, I think what it does is, and I've, I've come to this epiphany recently, is that the answers are right there in front of us. But we got to be able to know enough to see them. And if we look at what's out there, we'll see what bugs are going on. Then we say, ah, instead of looking in the fly box first, 
look out there. The answer is there. You say, okay, there's bugs in my face, but we're too busy looking in the fly box. Whereas if we look out and said, oh, that looks like that. I'll put that fly out there. It's mm -hmm. appropriate. So it's, it's abundantly obvious. It's only obvious if you know. Mm -hmm. So it's getting people to know the basics so they can start asking the questions um, with the gear, with the flies, um, with the where to go. And I mean, the last course we talk about, you show up to a river, you show up to a lake. What do you actually look mm -hmm. for? Instead of rocking up to a lake saying, okay, there's a body of water, I'm gonna walk out to belly button deep and then throw it out into the middle mm -hmm. of the lake. The reality is most of the fish are probably behind you and you scared half of them. Mm -hmm. So bottom line, start slow, be observant, take a course, it'll give you a leg up on it. And then the casting alone, you'll learn to cast properly straight out of the gate. If you learn to cast from Uncle Johnny, it might be tough because you're going to have to unlearn some things to get that skill because fly casting, quite frankly, is very, very easy. But the simplicity is hard. So and, that, and that's the thing is, guys, we want to brute strength it. We want to show how strong we are. And, and fly casting isn't that. It's timing. It's tempo. It, it's getting it right. And basically, we teach the basics of that. You can do the basics right. All the advanced stuff comes easy. Thanks. I know that over years I've done some advanced um, casting schools, and generally what happens with our advanced casting schools is that we rip it right back to the very basic casting stroke, and we work on that because there's a sort of an error that goes out there that says uh, practice makes perfect, but in actual fact all that practice does is make permanent, and if you're doing it wrong, then you'll continue to do it wrong. And I know that um, if you get your, your technical skills up, then you've got some amazing other fishing which is available. And obviously in the last uh, three or four years, most people will have heard about the quality of saltwater fishing up at lakes of, uh, of Collingwood where you've got um, kingfish available on the fly. And I've been one of those very privileged to be able to uh, get right involved with that there. And uh, I know what your feelings generally are on that sort of thing. But again, accuracy, performance, technical knowledge is very, very important. And, if, and, and of course, if you, you come in to talk to us, as we obviously are here uh, at, at your disposal, and even get us involved in, in, in teaching a bit of casting and so forth, or even going out like with, with Darian for a day uh, in a guided situation, you just learn so much. It propels you from that point on because you gather all the, uh, the lessons of that time and they continue to go with you. Now, I, I'm really fascinated because, you know, I'm listening to, um, to Doc telling us that is going to be an amazing mouse year this coming year. And um, from what is being said, it sounds like it could be true. How are you feeling about that? I'm quite excited about it because I, I was pretty excited about the last mouse year that we had that really was two years back to back. Um, and this one is, is different where last time it was really confined to a narrow alley of a few rivers. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one could be as big as you know, basically from Canterbury North and from Queenstown South, basically everywhere there's beach forest, they're saying it's masting and potentially a mouse plague. So we won't have this huge concentration so everybody goes to one place. We'll have this dispersion. And, I mean, as you know, the fish go from four, six, eight pounds to 10, 12, and I've even heard of 16-pound mm -hmm. fish, which is just mind-bending. Mm -hmm. So... Great fun on a fly rod too. Uh, I know there's a lot more of the other techniques, which are the crossover techniques, which have come over from uh, our canal fishing, where we're using ultralight gear, we're using touch fishing, we're drifting uh, various nymphs basically down onto fish. Um, that's a whole area that, again, uh, you know quite a bit about, and uh, do you see the potential of that in some of our, our rivers and, and uh, lake areas to catch more fish? Well, the yeah, the, the touch fishing is a delivery system. I mean, it's like long-range check nymphing, so, which was, the, the, I think, the essence of how we did it. I guess the English have trotted maggots for years. And I guess we're doing that in, in a type of sense. So, I mean, I, I don't think we've invented anything that wasn't invented already. And I think that, that's the beauty of sy the synergy of fishing is that you take from what's available and utilize it for our area. So we can use these, and we've used them in the canals. But where else can you apply yeah. them? I mean, it's, it's limitless. And then that's really the fun thing is that as fishing gets dip more difficult, you have to start pulling new tricks out of the bag and you can't just be a one trick pony anymore. You have to figure out how do I succeed when my technique doesn't have the same effectiveness. And mm -hmm. that's the beauty, whether it's in the canals, whether it's in the back country, whether it's in the lakes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a dynamic system. That's why it's fun. 
Well, it gets us up in the morning, doesn't it? It's amazing how um, when I have a meeting at four o'clock in the morning to go somewhere, how keen those who are truly have the disease, like you and I, uh, are there right on time, making sure we're never late. I don't think I've ever had to wait uh, for Darian when it comes to a meeting time. He's always there at that particular time, simply because it's just so much fun. And there are just still limitless possibilities. It's not like um, it's all over. I know sometimes there's a bit of... Um, negativity that goes around our, our general fishing areas and we can easily be negative and I think uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that over the years of dealing with people more and more people are coming from overseas whereas a lot of New Zealanders don't appreciate just what's on their own back doorstep because it might be either too hard or we've just become too familiar with it. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this year. I know that the mouse fishing's got me sort of agitated. I get to uh, a particular time of year, and of course this is going out into what's basically going to be springtime, and I've already got plans and thoughts about catching kingfish. I've got plans and thoughts about catching mice. I've got myself always somewhere amped for what's going to be going. I'd like to get another couple of really big fish. I'd love to get a 40-pound uh, trout out of the uh, canals, as I guess a lot of people would do. I have people, uh, friends of mine who've done it, and I do see these other challenges as um, being able to keep us going that way. So tell us some of your uh, challenges. That What would you like to achieve? Well, I certainly would like to get back up to Collingwood this year. Uh, it was it was a tough year last year, and the weather just didn't play ball when when I had time off, so I couldn't quite get up there last year. But seeing those kingies on the rays is, is certainly it captures the imagination. You have to bring it all together because invariably you've got a wind blowing onto your dominant shoulder. You've got to put that fly out there, forty to fifty feet, and the opportunity is there and it's gone. If you don't move to it you may never get it. So you do got to earn it up there. And I, I think that that challenge and the speed of the system, it's, it's, it's not lake fishing that you're waiting for the fish to come back on their beat and you can have a cup of tea and say, oh, here he comes. You know, I've got my fly already in place and I'll give it a one inch twitch. And he goes, oh, dragonfly, it eats it. This is, you know, you got to put it out there and then speed kills. I mean, it's, it's so dynamic that if you ain't pulling that fly fast enough, they lose interest. I mean, nothing slows down to get eaten in the saltwater environment. So these kingies are like, why isn't it moving faster? It must be wrong. So they don't go for it. So you got to be moving at such a speed. And that is, is, is quite compelling because they'll come right in on you and they're right at your feet. And then they go, oh, good, eh? And they leave. <laughs> they, they just wink at you and they're off. And you go, oh, I ran out of real estate. So getting that cast far enough out there, it's huge with those kingfish. Well, Darren, you've got me all wound up again. Can't wait for all the events coming up. And uh, I know that it's going to be a great year. Boy, what a fantastic place to, to fish. It's New Zealand, isn't it? It is amazing. You're not racing back to the United States just yet? Certainly not. I hear that your dad actually moved over here because the fishing was so good, or was it just because of the grandkids? Oh, it's definitely a little bit of both. I mean, the fishing is mind-bending, and if you have that on your doorstep, it's pretty darn good. And having a son as a guide certainly helps. So, uh, yeah, he appreciates that too. So yeah, the grandkids are certainly a sweetener. Is there anything else you'd like to add at this point, mate? Well, we do have the Complete Angler School coming up here August 20th here at the shop, 7 p.m. So if you're keen on fly fishing and getting into it before the mouse year, at least getting the ability to learn how to do it properly and succeed. Uh, it's a good thing. So we have that here at the shop. If you're keen, give the shop a call, look up on the website. Uh, if you want one-on-one -on -one tuition, I'd be happy to arrange that for anybody and or guiding. Um, but yeah, no, looking forward to this upcoming season. There's a lot of possibilities coming up with mice, with kingfish, and the canals too. So it's just, it's, it's pretty cool. Thanks, mate. You've got us all fired up. 